Tony Northrup recently published a video about Steve McCurry's Afghan girl portrait, one of the most famous portraits of our time. And the summary and the gist of that video was that she did not want her picture taken and it was taken anyway. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend checking it out. Anytime I see a controversial video, I prefer to do my own research because sometimes people present cherry picked information, you know, to kind of paint their view. So I did my own research carefully over this period of many days, almost a week. And I want to share with you some of the questions and conclusions that I have come to. It's one thing to take a picture. It's another thing in terms of how that picture is used. I see those as two completely different things. We have certain rights in terms of freedom of expression in the United States that we can go down to a park and take pictures of kids all day long. Nothing's illegal about that. The problems come when how those pictures are used and whether or not those children are identified. So the questions that I have are more specifically aimed towards the National Geographic as a publication. Number one, and this would resolve a lot of the questions regarding Afghan Girl, who signed the model release? Teacher can't give consent. Sharbat Gula, the girl, couldn't. She's underage. And there's some conflicting information in terms of whether it was her father or her grandmother that was alive. I'm still not sure. In an interview, she says her father took her from Afghanistan to Pakistan. But if her father or her grandmother were alive, they were the adults who could give consent. If either one of them were alive and signed the release, I would tell Tony, probably should take the video down and issue an apology. As far as I understand, they didn't have her name. And if you don't have her name, you don't have a model release. And if you don't have a model release, the next question becomes, how is this legal? It wasn't photojournalism. Photojournalism falls under very specific guidelines and ethics. It has to be timely. It has to be objective. It has to follow a narrative. As soon as he started posing her and telling her to take her scarf down, this is not photojournalism. I think most of us can agree to that. So if there's no release and this wasn't photojournalism, how is it legal? Because if you were a parent or you had a loved one, 12 year old girl in a school, and a foreign photographer showed up, asked the teacher for permission, took her picture, went home, made probably millions of dollars on it, made her famous around the world, and you didn't give consent, you better believe there would be a legal war. And the problem that I have with this is that because we live in first world countries, nobody would dare do that. She didn't have that protection in the moment. And, and so these are the legal questions. And there may be some convoluted, twisted way in terms of, yeah, well, it's a nonprofit organization, and yeah, this is for the sake of education. That's just the legal side of it. There is a whole different moral question here, and I see the difference between what we can do legally very different than what we should do morally. Those are two different things. In 1948, the United Nations issued the Declaration of Human Rights, and I'm going to read Article 12 to you. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of law against such interference or attacks. That is the right to privacy. And my personal interpretation of that is that everyone has the right to be left alone and remain anonymous if they want to. I've seen at least two pictures of Sharbat Gula holding a scarf in front of her face, and this is an active position. This is not a passive position. It means this takes effort to do. She didn't want her picture taken. So showing your face may not be a big deal to you and I. We obviously live in a modern age where selfies are very common. But in the context of the time, in the context of her religion, in the context of the culture, a brutal cult culture that she was living in, most of us can't even imagine what they go through. Showing a face, this may have been the only dignity that she had left as a little girl. To her, this was what was valuable, was not showing her face. That's my understanding. And if, you know what, I was in the room, I'd say, put the camera down. She doesn't want her picture taken. And I've been in those situations where people didn't want their picture taken. No problem, I'll put the camera down. So in terms of those moral questions, I would continue to ask, why was she made famous against her will? Why was her privacy invaded? How much money has been made off this photograph, both for National Geographic as well as Steve McCurry? How is it used in advertising? And how can we morally condone this type of behavior? Other questions would include, how often has this happened before? What are the guidelines and training given to photographers when dealing with indigenous or marginalized or parentless 
orphans when you're taking their picture, where there may not be the protection of law? What is the default and what is the oversight? Who holds National Geographic accountable to make sure that this is done correctly? Is this a self-policing thing? How do we even know? This, these are the kinds of questions we need to ask as a society instead of being concerned about how we can make money on this. Okay, the, the, so there's what we can do and there's what we should do from a moral perspective. It is critical to note that in 2002, Steve McCurry in National Geographic went to Afghanistan, tracked her down. They have provided some help to her. They, my understanding is they purchased a house. There was a sewing machine, a trip to Mecca, maybe some medical and legal care, and that's great. But I would really be interested to know in terms of how much total money was made and how much ended up back to her. This is an easy question to answer. That picture is auctioned off by National Geographic. I've seen it for over $144,000. And that is a, a poor refugee girl that has nothing. So in terms of Tony's video, there were some some things I disagreed with. Obviously the burqa was incorrect. There, you know, I'm not sure on, the, I think the age was 12 going on her birth date to the time of the shoot. Unclear who was alive, but Tony raised some incredibly valuable questions. Tony, I'm proud of you for making that video, really. Many people have come to the defense of Steve McCurry, that he's a he, you know, a great photographer and he's very skilled, and he is. Go to his Instagram page, look at his work. He is outstanding in terms of composition, color, precision. He's a master, he's one of the best. There's no question about it. But I see talent and skill as separate from ethics. So many things in the news today when we're, we're reading about movie stars or producers or athletes who are getting in trouble ethically. Skill set does not excuse questionable ethics. Okay, those are two completely different things. And Steve McCurry is no stranger to controversy. And he's a grown man who can defend himself, who has resources, he has money, he has a team. Okay, he has laws that protect him. 12-year-old refugee girl in a Pakistani camp? No, just she doesn't have those things. Whose rights are you more concerned about? The right of the photographer to take her picture or the right of the Afghan girl to remain anonymous? She didn't have anybody speaking for her in that time. A couple years ago, there was this whole controversy about Steve McCurry photoshopping his images and he came out and he would say one thing and people went and found more photoshopped images and then he pulled them down and then he comes out with a statement saying, hey, I'm a visual storyteller. And I have seen a few comments where he says one thing, but he actually does something else. There was an interview given on the Washington Post where somebody specifically asked him about permission given in the first and the second photo shoots. And he's very careful to say that he had to have permission, but he answered the question in regards to the second photo shoot. So I've seen this a couple times from him, the Photoshop stuff. He said, yeah, you know, take pictures as they should be. And now he's a visual storyteller, which is weird because the guy built his career as a photojournalist. And, and you go back and learn that he staged these images. And so these are very important considerations when we're talking about the rules and ethics that were followed in the case of the Afghan girl. Some people will say the passage of time, hey, it was a long time ago, let, you know, let sleeping dogs lie, all that other stuff. That's not a good answer for me. I've also seen many people refer to the BBC interview that she did where she said she was proud of the picture. That's cherry picking that interview. She actually says the picture did more bad than good and she blames it for making her famous and eventually getting her kicked out of Pakistan. So many of your comments have talked about the amount of good that's come from this picture and there's no question about that. There was a charity set up by National Geographic after they found her, it raised over a million dollars. In terms of the general awareness that that picture has brought to the refugees, incredible, absolutely correct, positive. As a photographer who has taken pictures for nonprofit organizations in disaster zones, however, there's a dichotomy I have to make you aware of. General awareness versus individual dignity. We're talking about individual people, even children, in disaster zones or in the case of a refugee. That is sacred. And if you cannot maintain the dignity of your subject, general awareness doesn't matter. Here's the reason. General awareness can come 10,000 different ways. It's not like if you don't take this picture of this person, you can't raise awareness in other you know, means. But if you make this person famous, it can damage them in a number of ways, especially in a culture like that, where showing your face may be shunned upon 
by the culture. Okay, these are things that we need to think about in terms of the fallout of taking advantage of somebody's dignity. If you cannot do it without taking advantage of their dignity, don't do it. That's the dichotomy. The general awareness is a very heavy burden for photojournalists. That's, that's tricky, man. That is not always black and white. And you may find yourself in a situation where you have to make that decision. You might be walking down the street and see a car accident and you're gonna to need to make a decision. Do I capture this right now? Or do I let this crying mother have this sacred moment to herself? Okay, we don't wanna make people famous for suffering. And there are times we need to put the camera down and treat people with respect that they deserve. In regards to the personal attacks that I've seen in so many of them uh, towards Tony Northrup, I wanna go on record and say, Tony is not a perfect man, No, nobody is. If you're looking for flaws and faults in him, you're gonna find them. But he is also one of the most kind, generous, humble, giving people I have ever met. Tony and Chelsea came down to Puerto Rico. I have worked with them in disaster zones. I have worked them like dogs, loading and unloading trucks. They have never once complained, and I have seen them in multiple situations, generously giving lots of money to different situations. So the idea is that, that they're lazy, or they're greedy, or this is about clickbait. They, they didn't make any money on that video. They don't care about that. They don't need that. That video was to bring awareness to the photographic aspects of taking pictures of unprotected children. That's what the video was about. In any event, my perspective is that as somebody who has, I live in a first world country and I have resources, it's my duty personally, and maybe it's yours as well, to look after and care for and enable and help victims of disasters, marginalized people in society, to stand and be self-sustained. It's our job to protect and help them, enable them, not exploit them for money. That's my opinion. Do the research, come to your own conclusions, and if you feel passionate enough about it, make a video like this and publish it. National Geographic, I want those answers. I am Michael the Maven. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.